Okay, great. We're back. So I think we was kicked out slightly too early from the other session, but hopefully everyone got most people got their questions answered. Um, so we're moving away from kind of our markdown and styling for a while, and we've got James Blair from our studio here to talk about APIs and R with Plumber. So I'll leave the stage to um, to James and just a quick reminder that you can ask questions and you can vote for questions, and we'll try to cover as many as we can. Uh, so James, if you want to um, share your Great. Okay. Uh, today we're going to talk about APIs in R with Plumber. And like was mentioned, my name is James Blair. I work as a solutions engineer for our studio. Uh, to give you an idea of the kind of the agenda today, I want to set the stage with a, a kind of a common data science type task, uh, and then we'll talk briefly about what an API is and, and why our users might care about APIs. And then we'll spend some time looking at exam and an example of how you might build an API in R using the Plumber package. And then we'll briefly conclude by talking about ways to deploy these APIs so that they're more widely accessible and, and leave you with some additional resources in the event that you want to continue learning and exploring about APIs in R. And just kind of as a side note, I, I gave a webinar on the same topic uh, for our studio just a little less than a month ago. A lot of this material is reused. So if you tune into that webinar, uh, I apologize. A lot of this will seem very familiar. Um, and if you didn't, here's a, here's a good chance to get kind of caught up on some of the content that I, that I discussed there. But I felt that it was still relevant to, to what's being shared today. And, and a lot of this, uh, just kind of as, a, as another side note, a lot of this content here is uh, new to the Plumber package. So the, so the Plumber package was, was recently updated and, and I'm hope, hoping to highlight some of the new updates that came with that package update here in our, in our examples that we looked through today. All right, so let's, let's start like we do as analysts or data scientists or statisticians or actuaries or whatever with some data, right? In most cases, a problem begins with some data. And we're going to use uh, the Palmer Penguins data set. So this is a, a relatively newcomer to the R data set world, uh, but it's touted as a, as a quote unquote replacement for the ever popular, um, you know, flower data set that we, that we typically use. Um, and, and this is the IRS data set. And this is, this is a, a nice kind of easy to understand and an easy to kind of reason about data set that contains 344 different observations for three different species of penguins. Um, and so let's say that we've been given this data set for one reason or another. And, and what we wanna do is try to say, look, if, we, if we're unable to successfully identify the species of a particular penguin, uh, but we're able to obtain specific body measurements from that penguin, can we reliably predict what that species is? Uh, and again, this is not a this is this the purpose of this talk is not to talk about uh, you know model building and the and the latest and greatest techniques for developing and building comprehensive models in R. So our approach here is going to be a relatively simple one where we'll take this data set and we'll run it through um, and and build a, a pretty straightforward random forest model that we've that that we use uh, some tools from from the tidy models package to do. Now in this case, and and as a as a former data scientist, right, this was always the point where work started to get maybe a little bit interesting and a little bit nerve wracking because now I was done doing what I was good at, which was building these models. And I had to do something that I wasn't always great at, which was like communicating the model. And more often than not, that was always kind of a disappointing part of the project. I can remember working on a number of different projects where we would take a data set, we'd pour over it, we'd analyze it, we'd understand it, we'd, we'd modify it, we'd add features, we'd remove it, we'd do all this whole process, weeks and weeks of work uh, with this data set, all to really fine tune the performance of some model so that we could understand behavior, we could predict outcomes and things like that. And then at the end of the day, um, I, I created like three or four PowerPoint slides and I went and presented that to a group of people and, and that was it. That was that was the end of that project and uh, and all that work had, had kind of culminated in a handful of PowerPoint slides. And that always left me feeling a little bit empty because I felt like there should be more, more that I could do, right? But part of the problem was I didn't really have a good mechanism to like further distribute my model, right? It was built in at the time, this was a number of years ago, at the time it was a niche language in R um, and, and it just didn't really have a, a permanent home. There wasn't a good place for that model to continue to live. Um, other than in my little R Studio session, and that always left me asking this question of, okay, well, now what, right? I've I've, I've done all this work, 
Um, and I, and it feels like it has more to offer, right? Maybe I, maybe I built this model that classifies penguin species, um, which is great, but how can I, how, like, how can I make that more useful, right? Wouldn't it be great if I was able to put that model in the hands of field scientists who are making these penguin measurements so that in real time, they could understand the predicted species of these penguins they're working with or something like that, right? Again, using our example here, but you can imagine any number of use cases where maybe I could, you know, wouldn't it be nice if this model was available to, to, to make real-time predictions on new data. Um, and the nice thing is that's where APIs come in. And, and I want to take just a minute. This is not, again, the, the, the goal of this talk and our time together here isn't to create a comprehensive overview of what an API specifically is, but, but rather this is to, to kind of highlight a little bit about APIs and, and provide a brief introduction if you're unfamiliar and then showcase how Plumber as an R package can be used to build APIs in R. So an API stands for Application Programming Interface. There's like API in itself is a kind of a nuanced term and can mean lots of different things depending on the different contexts that it's been used in. And so for the context of this talk and the conversation we have today, we're going to be talking specifically about web APIs over HTTP. And really what this is, is this is basically like how the internet operates. Um, whenever you visit a website or download something or interact with, with a Facebook mobile app on your phone or whatever the case is, um, there is an underlying structure to the requests that are being sent to different servers across the world. And those servers are receiving requests and responding with different pieces of information. Right. So, so to kind of give you an example here, whenever you open up your web browser, whether it's Google Chrome or Safari or Firefox, whatever, and you put in a URL for some website, your web browser sends a specially formatted request to a server somewhere and says, hey, I'm, I'm looking for this website, right? I'm looking for this location. And that server will send back either a bunch of HTML that your browser will then render so that you can see and view the website or that might send or it might send back an error message that says oh you know you don't have access to this website or oops it doesn't look like anything exists there or whatever the case is but what's neat to, to understand about that is underneath the scene you know behind the scenes your web browser is communicating with all these different servers um, via these these web apis um, and, and that's really, that's, it's nice because it provides a, essentially these web APIs provide a standardized way for machines to communicate and request information from one another. And that information could be something really simple, right? I might, again, in the case of a web browser, I'm not asking for anything more than just, hey, I think you've got a bunch of, of HTML, I'd like to see it. And the server says, oh, totally, here you go, here's the HTML. And then my browser is able to take that HTML and, and make a web page that I can use and interact with. But APIs can be more complicated, right? If, I, if I'm using, again, going back to an earlier example, if I'm using, for example, the, the Facebook mobile application on my phone and I make some sort of a, a status update, that's going to communicate with the main Facebook servers via an API that makes a change to my current status, right? So my request will include some information about the status update I'm making and the server will say, oh, I need to update that status. And somewhere in a database somewhere, my status gets updated. And then the server says, hey, I've, I've done what you asked me to do. I have to do the status and, and then I move, I move on. So these APIs provide a, an incredible amount of flexibility in terms of how you interact with other servers and other machines. And as a side effect, because this is a, a standardized way of communication, because there's a standardized way of how these APIs are sent and received, it doesn't matter what language or tool or framework these APIs are written in as long as they're communicating across the same standard. And what that allows us to do is that allows us to do something in R with the plumber package where we can take existing R code and we can turn it into an API that is then accessible from a variety of other tools and languages. And this goes back to my earlier question of, okay, I've built this model, I finished this task, but now what? What's the next step for me? And what an API does is it allows me to say, look, I've, you know, I get, again, I've built this model that, that is really great at predicting penguin species. And now our front end JavaScript developer can use this model in the website they're building, or my C sharp development development team can build a mobile application that uses this model because instead of me needing to go teach another team, how to use R so that they can use my model. And instead of me needing to turn my model over to another team so they can convert it into a different language, 
we can all communicate across a shared interface, right? These web APIs. And that's what Plumber allows me to do. It allows me to take what I've done in R and open it up so that other tools and other languages can use it without needing to do any sort of conversion process or rewriting or refactoring the code into some other framework. And that really simplifies this process of taking my thing that I've done, right? It might be a model, it might be something else and saying, look, this can now be used by any other piece of technology within the organization or even right across the globe if I'm, if I'm building something that I wanna make publicly accessible. So given that little bit of an introduction into what APIs are and then what like the role that Plumber plays in creating these APIs in R, let's take a look specifically at how Plumber operates and how Plumber works. Um, here's an example on the left of a, a typical Plumber file. So if you are an RStudio user and you go to the new file menu and you have a recent version of RStudio, one of the options will be to create a new Plumber API. It's built into the, the IDE itself that you can just, just similar to a shiny application, I can say, I want to I want to start a new Plumber API. And what you'll get is you'll get a kind of example API file that looks like what I've got pulled up here on the left that gives you some starting points to kind of see how this works. And what I want to focus on is if we look just at the R code here for a moment, instead of looking at everything else. So if you look just at the R code, you'll see that I have a couple of different functions defined. Um, this first function takes a single parameter called message. And then all it does is returns a list that contains a little printed printout of that message. Uh, and then my second function takes no arguments and instead returns just a random plot of some values. Okay, so these functions aren't anything incredibly complicated or even incredibly interesting, but the point is they're just standard R functions. So they could really be doing anything. They could be calling a model. They could be training a model. They could be running a bunch of uh, conditional statements to determine whether or not somebody qualifies for a loan. There's any number of things these functions could be doing because at the end of the day, they are just R functions. And the great thing about Plumber is once I've reached the point where I've got some functions written, if I want those functions to now be able to respond to incoming requests from other services, the way that I do that is by using these special comments. So what I have highlighted here in this yellow box shows how Plumber operates. I have this pound symbol or, or hashtag symbol, which is the comment in the R language. And then I follow that up with an asterisk uh, that indicates to Plumber, hey, this is a special comment that, that tells Plumber to do something. And, and then I have these tags that begin with the at symbol that identify the different pieces. So here's the title of my API, Plumber example. And then here's a description of what this function does. It echoes back the input. And here's a description of the parameter that I'm gonna use. And then finally, this last line here is perhaps the most important. And what this line says is, if any, if any client makes a get request to the echo endpoint or the echo path, then this function should respond, okay? So this defines kind of the mechanics of how the API is put together. What path or what endpoint does this function respond to and what types of requests, in this case a get request, does this function respond to as well? So if, when it comes down to it, using Plumber involves kind of three distinct things. Write standard R functions, so organize your code as functions. And you'll notice in the example file I have pulled up, these functions aren't named, right? I, don't ha I haven't assigned this function to any sort of name. That, that doesn't matter. If I, if I had assigned this to a, to a function called echo, uh, or to, if I had given this function a name called echo or something, that wouldn't change the behavior here. Um, so I write these standard R functions. I use these comments to decorate my script and indicate to Plumber how to use these functions. And then that's it. And then I can, in, in this case, I say plummet. And, and that in, in, the, in the RStudio development environment, if you click this run API button, it will generate and run the API for you. To give, a nice, to give us an idea of what that looks like, Here's an example of, of that same API being run inside the RStudio IDE, right? So I click run API, I have this nice interface that shows up. I can click on my different endpoints, echo endpoint. I can give it, I can try it out, say hello world, execute that. And if I scroll down here, I'll see that I have this response that says the message is hello world, just like what my function describes, right? The message is hello world. Um, this is really a nice way of doing things, right? I can build the API and our, I, in our studio, I can test it out here in our studio by clicking this run API button. And then I have access to this little interface that's built in that shows me, hey, your API is up and running and, and here we go. So with that little bit of an introduction, what I'd like to do is let's walk through the process of how we take the model that we built to predict penguin species and turn that into a responsive API so that somebody could submit new data 
and get back in return a predicted outcome in terms of the species of the particular penguin that, that they have. So I'm going to switch over now and I'm going to open up our studio. Um, so here we've got our, our studio window. I've got my console over here on the right hand side. I've got, um, I'm going to minimize this. I've got my files down here. All of the code and, and everything used and, and the examples used and the slides are available on GitHub. I'll share a link towards the end of the, the, the talk here. So all these resources will be available for you to go and visit if it's something you want to look into further. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to load the plumber package. And then because of the way that I trained my, my model, I'm going to load a few packages that I use for my model so that it, it's able to to have the necessary pieces to, to run predictions against my model. So I'm going to load the parsnip library, and I'm going to load the, or the parsnip package, and I'm going to load the ranger package because that's what I used when, when training my model. Um, and now I'm going to bring my model in here. It's available in my in my working directory. So I'm going to say read uh, read RDS. I've already saved this model out, right? So oh, this model RDS. And we can see that over here, right? I've got this model RDS file. This is just the serialized version of the model that I previously trained. Okay. And we're not going to dive into the details of how I trained that. It's, that's that's not the important the, the important piece here. Okay. So now I've got these pieces in place. I've got the plumber package loaded. I've got the, my, my model brought in, right? I've got this model object. Um, I want to just kind of define what I want. So what's my goal here? My goal is I want, um, I want users to be able to, I want users to submit new data um, and have the model respond with predicted species, okay? Um, so essentially what I really want is I want to do something like, uh, you know, predict, uh, my model, and then have some new data that, that gets predicted, right? And this new data can it comes from the, the user or the client. And, and it's important to understand that this new data might come from a JavaScript application. It might come from a mobile application. It might come from a website. It doesn't matter because Plumber is going to handle all that. All I need to know is like I'm getting some new data, and I want to be able to use my model to generate predictions and then return those predictions back to whoever it was that submitted that. Um, so before we before we build out that particular piece, let's just make sure that we have everything kind of set up for success here. So I'm going to create a function here um, that doesn't take any sort of arguments, but all it's going to say, all it's going to return is a list that says, okay, the status is um, okay, and the time is this time. Okay. So if I if I execute this function, and we'll call this um, help check. Oops, if I could type, there we go. All right, so if I run this health check function, health check, we see I get this list that says status is okay and time is blah, blah, blah. And that time is gonna update every time, right? Because it re-executes the system time command. And all I'm doing is this is just a, a kind of generic function that I can use to make sure that my API is running properly. I can send a request here and I should get back in response this information of status and time. In order to tell Plumber that this is what I want to do, I'm going to create my little special comment, and I'm going to say, okay, this is a this is a endpoint that determines if the API is running properly, and then we'll say uh, respond to get requests at the health check path, and let's give our API a, a title here. We'll say API title is uh, Penguin Predictions Predictions. Okay. Um, now, if I save this, uh, I've got this run API button that shows up up here. And if I run this, we should see pulled up over here. I have this penguin predictions API, and I've got this default location here. And, and here I've got this health check endpoint. And if I click on this and try it out, we can execute this. And what we should see is something like this status okay, time, blah, 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 10.05.37. And if I run this again, we should see that that 10.05 changes, right? Now it's 10.05.46. So I can see that this is totally working, right? I'm submitting, I'm submitting requests and I'm getting back a valid response. Um, so let's move forward. Let's say, okay, now let's say that I want to, um, I want to create this model endpoint that I, that, I, that I plan on using. So we'll say predict is a function um, and then in this case, what I need to do is my, my input data is going to come in my request object. And so Plumber makes two objects available to you, a request and response. And so I'm going to pass those both into my function here. 
And then I'm going to say what I want to do is I want to predict um, using my model and the new data equals as dot data dot frame. Oops. Uh, request dollar sign body. Okay. So Plumber, and this is a new feature for the latest release of Plumber. Plumber will take incoming data and parse that data into a into the the best approximate R object and make it available as this request body piece here. Right. So now I've got I've got access to my data. I'm using using this as dot data frame function here, just to make sure that even if I only have a single record that comes in, it doesn't get converted into a list. It actually stays as a, as a data frame. Um, so there we go, request body, and then we'll say type equals probability. So I get a list of probabilities for each associated um, penguin species. Okay, um, this is really all I need to do. Now I just need to decorate and tell, um, tell Plumber that this is, this is how I want this to work. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna come in here and I, I can say, um, predict penguin species, species, and we're going to say that we want the parser to be JSON, which means we want the incoming data to be JSON. We want the serializer to be CSV, meaning we want to turn the data into CSV data, and then we're going to respond to post requests at the predict endpoint. Okay, so this this just gives some details about how I want requests to be handled. Incoming data is going to be JSON. Take that JSON, turn it into a data frame. The outgoing response, so in this case, the response of my model or the results of my model should return to the client as a CSV file or a CSV data. And then I'm going to respond to post requests at this predict endpoint. And if we go ahead and stop this over here and run again, we'll see, let me pull this open so we can see it. We'll see I now have this new endpoint called predict. And I can come in here and I can click to write this out, but the problem is, I get this error that comes back, 500 internal error. Um, the issue is, I don't, I'm not like, there's no data. I haven't given this any data, and there was no place for me to give this data, right? If I try this out, there's nothing here that allows me to input some some penguin data to try this out. Um, that's that's a result of how this user interface is generated. It's generated using something called Open API. I'm not going to dive too deeply into what that is. It's, a, it's an entire specification on how APIs can be defined and planned out. But the nice thing is Plumber has support for modifying that, that API specification. So I'm going to do that here. I'm going to say I want to update the user interface. We're going to use a new special tag called at Plumber. And then here we're going to say, OK, function of my Plumber router. And we want to say PR, PR. Our set API spec, YAML, read YAML, open. Okay, so all this is doing here is I've got this, this file. I'm not going to look at it for the sake of time, but I've got this file that defines new features of my user interface. And if I run this now, what we'll see is I have the same interface, but if I come down to my predict endpoint, let me expand this a little bit. I now have the ability, it shows me what an example looks like. And if I try this out, I can modify this example, right? So I can pass in whatever data I want to, and I should see back, okay, we're getting an exception occurred. Let's figure out what's going on there. Let's come up here. Okay, is dot data frame is not true. Okay, so we're getting an error up here in our predict function, uh, new data is, as data frame request body type equals prob. We should be seeing this working. Um, the idea is we should see that this generates the predictions of our associated with our incoming data. Let me just change, I think, what I need to do here. And then we're I think we're rapidly approaching time. So let me make this change really quick and see if we can. Okay. All right. Let's try this one more time. It might work. Let's try it out. All right, we're still getting an internal error. Unused arguments. Oh, that's why. No, that should work. Okay, I'm not. I'm not going to live debug. This is always the fun of, of live demos, right? Is being able to kind of try to work through this. But let's let's look at an example of this, and then I'll I'll, I'll wrap up here. Um, 
let's say that I, I reach this point where this gets working. I resolve the issue that I'm experiencing here, which I think I might probably just have a comma that's out, out of place. Um, but now I want to publish this. One of the things that's great about Plumber is that it can be deployed in a variety of contexts, um, one of which is to do RStudio Connect, which is an RStudio product that, that we provide um, that provides easy, convenient publishing of things like Shiny applications and Plumber APIs, along with a variety of other content, including Python applications. But if I publish this to RStudio Connect, um, let's look for penguins, I can end up with something that looks like this. Um, and this will, this will take just a minute here to update. In fact, let's come back here. Um, but I'll end up with an interface here that looks exactly like what I saw in my RStudio IDE, but is now deployed in a location that allows others to come and access and interact with that API. So now I've got this API that's deployed in a way that others can come and make requests and see responses and have inter and have interaction um, in, the, in, that, in that format. Okay, uh, there's a couple of other ways that, that um, Plumber APIs can be deployed. I've, I've included some links in the slide to kind of de detail how, that, there's some details in the Plumber documentation on how you can approach deployment in some other ways as well. Um, and then just some additional resources here at the conclusion as we wrap up. Uh, the Plumber website and documentation has been massively overhauled from where it was a few months ago. So if you haven't looked at it recently, I would encourage you to go take a look at it. Um, and then there's a collection of GitHub repositories that contain additional information about Plumber and example APIs you can look at and learn from. And then all of the content for this particular talk is available at this repository here, kind of listed third from the bottom. Um, I think it'll be linked as well from, from some of the content that's, that's shared with, with participants as well. Um, and, and here's what that, what that repository goes ahead and looks like. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and, and kind of wrap up there and, um, and then turn the time back over to see, I don't know if we've got time for questions, but if we do, we can, uh, I'll turn the time back over for those. Okay, thank you. Um, I always appreciate a bit of live coding even though it's a, it's a risky um, thing. Uh, we actually had one question, and I think you answered it right at the end. So it was just around where you could publish Plumber API so other internal users only could access it. Um, but that might be the resources that you've linked to. Yeah, certainly. There's there's a variety of ways, right? So again, coming from our studio, I think our studio connect is a great way of doing that. Um, that is a paid product, and so it's something that would need to be kind of investigated to see if it makes sense. But there's a lot of advantages there with integrated security and scalability. But then at the end of the day, Plumber is just an API that's listening on a port. And so if you're familiar enough, you can use Docker to deploy these things. You could host this on its own server, and it just becomes managing that service to make sure it's always listening. So there's uh, like I said, in, in the additional resources, there's some good documentation on different ways and methods you can use for deployment from Docker, which is a very kind of roll your own self-serve solution to RStudio Connect where everything's bundled together and it's really easy to manage. Great. Thank you very much. And I'll just take this opportunity to remind people that all the slides will be on the NHSR community GitHub, so you should be able to uh, find the links easy, easily. Um, thank you, James. And we're going to have to move on to the next session. Um,